let me please introduce my friend, colleague, Professor Shavisaron Shronze, sir. So, um, this is going to be a bit different from what um, Ilana and Milet did. Um, I um, wrote something for Hana. This isn't the first thing I wrote for Hana. I mean, there were the papers, but there were the things dedicated to Hana, um, written especially for her. So, and um, and this is the second time so I wrote something for Hana that has to do with Virginia Woolf. Um, and but at the end, uh, I'll come to the very personal things I have to say about Hana. This is not an academic paper in any way. So this is called um, the Lighthouse. Hana knows why. Um, I begin with a quote. A tower, stark and straight, in the midst of, again, a quote, a great plateful of blue water. And on the right, as far as the eye could see, green sand dunes with the w wild flowing grasses on them, which always seemed to be running away into some moon country uninhabited of men, end quote. Virginia Woolf's lighthouse is a point of orientation in a landscape, poised between two infinities uninhabited of men, beyond the limit of the human, that is to say, beyond the limit of representation and language that emerge primordially as written, as what Freud calls a unary mark, a first stroke. Einziger Zug, for it says, German signifier whose plural form, Zeichen, resonates with Zeichnen to draw, with pen on, on paper or through wax, brush on canvas. Indeed, Wolf's lighthouse as point of orientation for a writing that might bar or limit the illimited beyond the first stroke, inaugurating the act of drawing of one substance within another that resists it, so as to produce the exploit of calligraphy, the written letter as drawn, is itself described, the lighthouse, as barred with black and white, the shades of calligraphy as bars on a white surface. Such bars or lines may, as Wolf's artist figure into the lighthouse, painter Lily Briscoe says, B, I'm gonna quote, running nervous lines, but precisely as nervous, that is to say, as written in the sand of the flesh of the nervous system and the symptom, circumscribe, or as Lily puts it, and close a space, which is none other than the space of what in the subject functions as a defense in the face of what would otherwise be a suffering unbearable because unenclosed. Life experience, as again in the words of Lily's narrated monologue, as a fluidity without bounds, and that may, Lily also says, have to do with her sex, that is to say, with a sexuality that is feminine. Other names of the unbearable in, in Lily's narrated monologue, I learned this term from Hannah, <laughs> include, again a quote, a few moments of nakedness when she seemed like an unborn soul, a soul reft of body, hesitating on some windy pinnacle and exposed without protection, end quote. For Mrs. Ramsey, the words pointing to the unbearable beyond the barrier, beyond the bar, include, again a quote, the core of darkness that could go anywhere, limitless, as her horizon at those horrific moments when it surges forth. Without the lighthouse as point of orientation, a subject exposed without protection, as Lily says, may be permeated with the insupportable that manifests itself psychically, not as pain, but a subjective fog. The sense of the long stretches of time which feel like cotton wool, to which Wolf attests in a sketch of the past. But that a point of orientation, a lighthouse, exists on the horizon, Wolf's to the light to the lighthouse teaches, does not guarantee a writing that could put the bar into place. Even when, as for Mrs. Ramsey, the lighthouse punctuates the time and place of a darkness with its strokes, writes in light. Um, even then, Mrs. Ramsey says, attaching oneself to its long steady stroke and the last of the, last of the three, which was her stroke, it be, brings momentary peace, but beneath it, Wolf writes, it remains all dark, all spreading, unfathom unfathomably deep. For to atta attach oneself to a stroke that writes in light, on and in the core of darkness, is to construct an identification too frail to sustain a life. It is not yet to write or paint, just as for Lily, 
again a quote, to set a, her clean canvas upon the easel is to erect what she calls a barrier, but one that she also says is to, still frail. As in her words, again a quote, there was all the difference in the world between this planning airily away from the canvas and the actually taking her brush and making the first mark. For most of Wolfe's novel, the lighthouse is the destination of a journey which is not undertaken. The first mark in Lily's portrait is not made. What is described in the novel as the portrait's first stroke, precisely Freud's Einzige Zug, is made only once on the level of the plot. The lighthouse ceases to be just point of orientation in the horizon when the journey towards it is under undertaken by the Ramses that remain. Drawing the first stroke is in effect the correlate in the psychic economy of Wolf's artist figure of the undertaking of the journey to the lighthouse, and it involves running what is described as the risk, resonating in the artist's last name, not without the implication of the body. I quote again. With a curious physical sensation, as if she were urged forward and at the same time must hold herself back, she made her first quick, decisive stroke. Once the first stroke is made, a possibility emerges. Others may predicate themselves upon it. I cite again. A second time she did it, a third time. And so pausing and so flickering, she attained a dancing rhythmical movement, as if the pauses were one part of the rhythm and the strokes another. Strokes and pauses coalesce to a rhythm, a rhythmical writhing, <laughs> writing, that is a writing that is of the flesh that desires and that bars the core of darkness that is the thing. Such predication of signifiers written on and with the sand of the flesh on a unary stroke is also precisely the psychic writing, writhing, Freud describes in a project for a scientific psychology, perhaps the roadmap for what would be any future psychoanalysis. While Wolf's novel teaches that the writhing of the first stroke cannot occur without the decided desire of a subject who makes use of a point of orientation, it does not make it clear what precisely occupies the function of the lighthouse as cause. What makes it possible to finally undertake the journey that is the diegetic, I learned that too from Hannah, <laughs> correlate of the subjective and aesthetic trajectories of Lily's painting and of, writing, of the writing of the book itself, with which the act of painting coalesces in the novel's extraordinary conclusion. Psychoanalysis teaches that this place is indeed constitutively empty, for it is none other than the, than the desire that inhabits the subject. It also teaches that in order to mobilize that empty place, it is very often necessary for the subject to posit someone else there, someone to whom one supposes knowledge, that unlike dry information knowledge, has that mysterious quality of allure, glitter, light, that Plato in the symposium calls agalma, the precious object that in that dialogue, Alcibiades insists is hidden in the person of Socrates. Such is Alcibiades' relation to Socrates, a paradigmatic case of the supposition of knowledge that is the kind of love capable of mobilizing desire that Freud called transference love. In the analytic cure, it is the analyst who occupies this empty place, not in absentia nor in effigy, Freud insisted, but paying with his own person so as to effect a word we heard a lot today, transformation. In writing to the lighthouse, Wolf attests in the sketch of the past, she writes, I suppose that I did for myself what psychoanalysts do for their patients. I expressed some very long felt and deeply felt emotion. And in expressing it, I explained it and then laid it to rest. Wolf does not disclose the object of her transference. What in the novel appears as that agalmatic object, the lighthouse. For me, however, Many years before my analytic formation, it was very clear that Hannah occupied that place. In fact, this is what I said, you remember, at a public event that marked a pivotal moment in my career, but much more than that in my own subjective trajectory, a moment that marked my, for me my having, in a way, found or created a place. An enclosed, cl enclosed space, such as Lily Briscoe speaks of into the lighthouse, which is the place where one can write, the subjective place, sp space where desire can be, 
and the interruptions of the core of darkness are at least temporarily barred. That's, and that, what I think, is also the space that is actually what is at stake in, in Wolf's A Room of One's Own, creating that space for herself. It was not the first time Hannah had agreed to my putting her in that place. By then, that had been the case for over a decade, if not more. And however agalmatic the lighthouse, transference, I know very well by now, is far from light and is complicated to manage. Like Wolf's Lily, I take risks, often considerable. If they are not inscribed in my name as they are in hers, they are part of the title of my first book, which grew out of the dissertation I wrote under Hannah's supervision. Hannah, as she put it to me, in her inimitably understated and gracious way, while we were both working on Wolf's last and dazzling novel between the acts, Hannah said, after I talk, I, I, I think I gave um, at the department, he wrote to me afterwards, I am not always eager to go so far. <laughs> so agreeing to undertake my transference, to support my work unconditionally and enthusiastically as Hannah unfailingly did over decades was a risk. Uh, was and is going far. For me, its priceless yield has been the possibility of undertaking the lifelong effort of creating a space for my writing, for my teaching, and in effect and in truth, a place for myself in life itself. If today I am able to continue this endeavor, it is because, and now is the time to affirm this, in the genealogy of this present was Hannah's agalmatic present firm as the lighthouse for many long years as what makes possible the holding oneself back so as, to not to so as not to fall as one surges forth to make the first stroke of what will have become one's vision. <laughs>